So let's first introduce some terminology. The gene pool refers to the set of all genomes in a specified population. And here we have an example from a population of warthogs. So here we have at a single uh, genetic locus two alleles, big B or little b. And here's an example of an individual who is homozygous for the big B allele and an individual homozygous for the little b allele. And here's an individual who is heterozygous for big B and little b. And together, the set of alleles in that population represents the gene pool. So when we are doing population genetics analyses, we can't actually go out and look at every um, genotype for every individual in a population. That would be unfeasible. So what we typically do is to infer frequencies um, by estimating them from a random sample. So in population genetics, each generation um, each new individual is viewed as drawing from a set of gametes with alternative alleles. So let's use an example here in which we have a set of marbles in a bowl. And initially, we have um, a distribution of um, 60 of the white marbles relative to 40 of the green marbles. And these, the white and the green are representing different alleles. So let's say that we're going to pick, we're going to reach into this bag and we're going to randomly draw out another 100 of these um, marbles. And now in the next generation, we have 80 of the white and we have 20 of the green. We're going to reach back in. We're going to grab another set of 100. And now in the next generation, we have um, 100 of the white alleles and zero of the green. And this is a demonstration of how we get changes in allele frequency over time. Allele frequencies will also change over time due to genetic drift, which is defined as random fluctuations of allele frequencies from generation to generation, simply due to chance. So as we see, sometimes things can happen, like these bugs are getting squashed, and that's going to change the, um, perhaps, the allele frequency in the next generation. Here's another example from some ladybugs, and we can see that um, perhaps in the next generation, just by chance, we're going to see more of these ladybugs with the dark colors, or we might see more that are with the medium colors and dots. And the fact is that drift is just an inevitable fact of life. I also want to uh, define what we mean by neutral evolution. So we define a selectively neutral allele as one that does not affect the reproductive fitness of individuals who carry that allele. So its frequency in the population changes by chance or genetic drift alone. And here we have an example. This is just um, a substitution in the third position of the codon. And when we have substitutions in the, of nucleotides in the third position, very typically they result in a silent or synonymous change. So here there's been a substitution, but there's no change in the amino acid. It remains as valine. So the rate at which genetic drift occurs is going to be inversely proportional to the population size n, and it's going to be very fast in small populations. And here's an example that we can look at based on computer simulation. So let's assume here that we have, we're looking at a single locus, and it has two alleles that are at 50% frequency each, as we can see here. We have a sample size of 25. And we're going to do the simulation over 80 generations. Now, each of these lines here represents a different simulation. And what we can see is that over time, alleles are either going to um, be lost from the population, or they're going to reach fixation, which means that they go to 100% frequency. And the rate at which this occurs is going to depend on the sample size. So in a small sample, it's going to be very rapid. But in this example where we have a larger sample, now n equals 300, you could see that it just takes more time. There's not as much genetic drift occurring. Now the end result is going to be the same, it just takes more time. Um, the change in allele frequency also is going to depend on the initial allele frequency. So in this particular case, we've now changed the starting frequency. It's not 50%, it's now 10%. And you can see that there's much more um, probability of loss of the allele in this case. And one, here we have just one of the alleles, 
um, reaching fixation. So again, in this particular case, about one out of 10 um, will eventually become fixed or reach 100% frequency. Now here's an example from a large population. It'll take longer for this to occur, but the proportion of the alleles are gonna be roughly the same. So again, roughly one out of 10 will go to fixation. It's just gonna take longer. Other important terms in population genetics are bottleneck and founder effects. And this is because genetic drift has a large effect on allele frequencies when a population originates via a small number of people from a larger population. So here we have an example of a bottleneck. And what a bottleneck means is that there's been a decrease in population size at some time in the past. So you could think of it as a population crash. And what happens when the population is very small, you're going to have a higher rate of genetic drift. And we can see here that these alleles, which are represented by the different colors, have shifted from what we're seeing back at this uh, earlier time. Now we go through the bottleneck, and now we're seeing predominantly these white and black alleles. Another example we can look at is a founder event, which is sort of a special case of a bottleneck event. And then in this case, it's where a population, a small population, breaks off from the larger population. And again, there's going to be increased genetic drift in this initially small population. And here, by chance, we just happen to see more of these dark blue and um, light blue alleles. The pattern of variation that we see in the human genome is also dependent on the effect of population size, which we um, distinguish as capital N sub E. And the definition of the effect of population size is the number of breeding individuals in a population. So estimates of NE are most strongly influenced by population sizes when they're at their smallest. And it could take many generations to recover from a bottleneck event. So estimates of NE in modern populations reflect the size of the population prior to population expansion. Pretty consistently, studies of nuclear sequence diversity in humans have estimated an effective population size of about 10,000. Now, by contrast, if we look at chimpanzees, the estimate is closer to 35,000. And so what that means is that humans have undergone a bottleneck sometime during their evolutionary history. So the pattern of genomic variation that we see in modern populations today is a reflection of our evolutionary and demographic history. So how much do we differ? Well, identical twins differ, have no differences at the nucleotide level. If we compare unrelated humans, we differ at about one out of a thousand nucleotide sites. And if we compare humans to our closest genetic relative, the chimpanzee, we differ at about one out of a hundred sites. So as a whole, our species is very similar, and that simply reflects our recent common ancestry from Africa within the past 100,000 years. But when you consider that there are over 3 billion DNA bases in the genome, that results in 3 million differences between each pair of genomes, more than enough to generate the diversity um, that will make each of us unique.